Hi, everyone, and welcome back to The Awakened Catholic Show. I am your host, Nick Delatore, and this is not your grandmother's Catholic talk show, unless she's a really, really cool grandmother. Anyways, today we have with us, for the second time on The Awakened Catholic Show, Father Leo Padalinghug. Uh, you might recall two years ago, we had Father Leo on, and it was uh, a, a riotous episode. It is honestly, you know, looking back, one of my favorite episodes. We had uh, so many laughs, and we went super deep at the same time talking about martial arts and food. Um, and towards the end of that episode, Father Leo said, Nick, we're not done. We're going to do more work together. And today we are here to talk about some of the more work that we are doing together. Father Leo, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. That was just me being prophetic or desperate for more you know, work <laughs> because I don't do enough. It, yeah. it, so this is this is great. It's good to, I mean, one of the things that I always remind people is that Catholics need to show that we actually work together mm. and as opposed to working against each other. You know, we have some people who claim to be Catholic who are so anti-life. We have to show what it means to really be Catholic and work for life. That is so true. Amen to that. Yeah. And, and there is a growing awareness in, in the community of Catholic creators and uh, speakers and authors that there is like this importance, this need for collaboration. Uh, and, you know, just recently I, I was uh, on the production team for the Theology of the Body Institute's Revealed Conference. And one of their specific uh, goals with it was to bring together different speakers and stuff that that do work on the theology of the body in their own ways. And, and instead of having everyone in their own little silos, like have these roundtable discussions that were just authentic opportunities for collaboration. And, you know, right now you, you just kind of made a joke and I don't know if people caught it. You made a joke about uh, that you don't do enough. Um, and you were giving me a rundown right before we started recording. Why don't you why don't you tell the good people watching or listening what all you are in the middle of right now? Uh. It's certainly not a nap, I wish. But, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, part of the work that I do is head and founder of Plating Grace. It's an international food and faith movement. I know it sounds absolutely ridiculous, but all they got to do is watch the previous show that we were on. And you'll hear how deep the theology is and about what our world needs to do is just come together and eat together. So, so I, that looks like uh, me as a speaker, as an author. I'm now writing my f fifth book. It's actually, I, I think I can say this now, it's not embargoed. I'm going to be writing um, the compendium for the Drinking with the Saints. So that same publication reached out and asked if I would do uh, Dining with the Saints. Oh my so goodness. I'm in the middle of that. Plus, I, uh, as a speaker, I, I have no idea what happened, but ever since people started lifting up the COVID restrictions, they kind of want to see people in person again. So I've got to try to trilocate to get to all of these <laughs> events that our people are asking me to do. But I can't do that internationally because I'm actually in Italy at present leading two pilgrimage groups, one for Italians, excuse me, one for Italy. And then I'm going over to Germany to do the Passion Play while at the same time filming six episodes for my TV show, which is Savoring Our Faith on the EWTN. And then all of that, um, you know, just keeping up with my prayers and, um, and, 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 and learning new cuisine. So it's a difficult life I lead, Nick. It's that very, is, very difficult. The Lord but. has asked much of you. Uh, yeah. There's no question. Um, I, I actually, I feel like what you just mentioned there about keeping up with your prayer. So, you know, you're a really, really busy guy. And, um, but, but a lot of people are busy in, in their own ways. Yours is just a very public, very visible busyness. Um, and, and I know as a dad, as a husband, uh, I run Awakened Catholic. My wife and I make music. Uh, we're, we're right now, we're in the middle of composing music for a Catholic cartoon. Um, and like we're, we're constantly doing a million things. And in the midst of all of that, being a disciple, being a son of God, maintaining that relationship in prayer, like that gets tough sometimes. What Would you have any insights into how you... Uh, do that because even though not everybody is a celebrity priest, chef, uh, you know, triple black belt martial artist guy that break dances, not even though not everybody is you in their own ways, it, it becomes difficult to find that time, right? How, how do you handle that on your end? Well, I mean, when you kind of describe it that way, now I feel like you're like a deranged individual, but all of that is true. Uh, and, and I think therein lies the answer. It's the only way you can do it. I mean, you just have to do it. You don't want to mm. do it. It doesn't always feel good to do it. You just got to do it. And when you don't do it, 
you just simply say, sorry, I didn't do that. And trust that God was still talking to you, still letting you learn something. I mean, and honestly, you know, like it'd be wonderful if I could just take the blessed sacrament wherever I go and I could have my own personal holy hour. You know, like I'm a priest. I could be able, I mean, I said mass this morning on my own, but I, I can't just walk into a church and be like, ciao, you know, can I stay an hour in your church? They're not going to know who I am and what I do. So what I have to do is find God where I am. And that just sounds so silly. And I know that sounds a little new agey, but I'm not a pantheist in any way. I didn't say Glad that, hear it. you know, like find God in the tree because the tree is God. That's a pantheist. A, a, a Catholic says God made that tree and that tree possesses qualities of God. Find in a way how God is speaking to you to the tree through that tree and realize that Jesus is died on the tree of life. Oh, boom. There's a meditation for at least a good 10, 15 minutes. Yeah. You know, like find God in, in the midst of, of, of having dinner with your friend that I hadn't seen in, in, this just happened last night too. I hadn't seen in years. And, you know, like I feel guilty that I didn't actually spend a full holy hour somewhere. And then God said, and what was that that you did at dinner last night? So I don't think God wants anyone to feel guilty for not praying the way they think they ought to be praying. God wants to use opportunities in a person's life to, to reconnect. I mean, why do we limit God to an hour? Why do we limit God to a gold box in the middle of the church? We have to realize that a God is and not a was or a will be. He was, is, and will be. So, wow. so people just stop limiting God, you know, and, and allow God to make himself present to you. That is so beautiful. I really love that. Just last night, uh, I was at a theology on tap. Um, and this guy, uh, Monsignor Tad Oxley, super awesome priest. Do you know him? You, your face is like, you know him. <laughs> I know him very okay. well. <laughs> I know. Him. I mean, like all the people that, you know, are cool. I'm like, Oh gosh, I guess that makes me cool too, because I know these yeah, people. Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. Monsignor Ross. Yeah, he was doing yeah. a talk at Theology on Tap about uh, meditation in the Catholic context. He talked about Lexio Divina. He talked about Ignatian uh, contemplative prayer and then um, other forms of contemplative prayer. And I just, one of the things that stood out to me that connecting it to what you were just describing is like, you can go so deep in in moments that you're not in a beautiful cathedral or in even a chapel, like you could go so deep in contemplative prayer. And in fact, maybe there's some irony in the fact that the catechism of the Catholic church says contemplative prayer is the highest form of prayer and you can literally do it anywhere. It's amazing. Um, and what you were just describing, the way that that tree can bring you into God and, and bring you into truth um, and beauty like that, that to me is a form of contemplative prayer. Like that, that's powerful stuff to find God there. Yeah, it's a, uh, oftentimes contemplative prayer is misunderstood as kind of like sitting with someone doing a gong and you're going, um, you know, like, like I can't sit in that position. I'm, I'm getting that old, all right? I mean, and, and if I had coffee that morning, there is no way in God's creation I'm gonna be sitting that still. Uh, and, and a lot of people think that your temperament kind of determines how your relationship with God is going to be. And that might be true because God made your personality and made your temperament. And not everyone is a monk. Mm. I mean, even St. Francis de Sales said that it would be silly if a priest tried to live like a lay person. It would be even sillier if a lay person tried to live like a, a nun or a cloistered, you know, religious member. So yes. we have to, first of all, understand who we are. <sighs> as God's children, and then find out how did God kind of make us in a unique way? And then how do we use that uniqueness to have a unique personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ? You know, a lot of people just forget that, that, that we as people are so unique that he has a special relationship with us because we are who we are. Mm. And if I can't, because of just the nature of my work, I can't beat myself up if I can't spend a holy hour, you know, we have to just know that is God with us at every moment of our life. And, and I'm getting old enough to know that, that, that if there's even like traffic, for example, like on the way down to an event, there was traffic. And I said, oh, that's my fault. I was praying for patience. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> And so, you know, that God is even speaking to us through these kind of these moments throughout our day. Yeah. We just have to be open 
to that unique personal relationship mm. and stop comparing yourself to other people's spirituality. I, it's that's, useless. Yeah, I think that that's so huge because even in my own experience, what you brought up about you're not a monk, like that's so relevant in my journey because before I got married and I was discerning priesthood, I spent time uh, with the monks at St. Meinrich <laughs> Seminary and I that completely transformed my spirituality in a beautiful, powerful way. I fell in love with the divine office, the liturgy of the hours. I fell in love with um, <laughs> silence. And like, as a single man, as a bachelor, I was doing the holy hours as often as possible. I was praying the divine office, praying the liturgy of the hours. And I was super hardcore about it. Like at a minimum, I did two of the hours every day. And sometimes I did three. And as soon as I was married and I had kids and my vocation was more clearly defined and I was living it out, it was really hard to keep up with that. And for the longest time, I was super down on myself. And then somebody literally said to me, Nick, you're not a monk. You're a husband and a dad. And so like what you just said there is so true in my own experience. And so, you know, watching, listening, uh, I just want to encourage you, like, reflect on what your vocation is, reflect on uh, your station in life and and the unique qualities of your character and your personality and go on a journey of discovery with God to, to navigate like, what does it look like for you to have that relationship and, and that prayer life? Because it's not going to look the same as your neighbor. It's not going to look the same as your friends. Um, yeah, I, I really appreciate that insight, Father. That's that's powerful stuff. Absolutely. Yeah, you're welcome. You know, I mean, as a, as a dad, as a husband, and as a full-time, you know, member of the church and ministry, you're not going to have always opportunities to have a holy hour, but you can have a holy life. Mm. I mean, but there are going to be times when you should just be grateful to have like a holy minute mm -hmm. I mean, because it's just God can speak. I mean, Jesus spent 30, quote unquote, 33 years on this earth, but we only know of three years, only know of three and the most powerful were the remaining three hours wow. that he hung on the cross. So, so let's not limit God to our under our meager conceptual understanding of time, because that just makes you more quote unquote more powerful than God. Mm -hmm. And and I always have to say this too because I I remind myself of this when it comes to sin. Remember that your sins, yeah, they're bad. They're bad. Some of them are really bad. And some of them are gross and bad. Embarrassing bad, funny bad, but they're bad. But which is more stronger? Which is stronger? Is it your sin or God's grace? Wow. So when we stop taking our eyes off of Jesus and what he has done and what he can do, that's when we start falling apart. That's good. That's really good. Um, You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man. So, so father, we are uh, going to be leading a group to Mexico later this year. And are we, we are. Yeah. <laughs> FYI. I'm kidding, I, knew that. <laughs> I just wanted to throw a curveball your way. It's, it's always like, fun. Yeah. I thought we were <laughs> exactly. like, did you just have like a demented moment here? I mean, like we were just talking about it before the show. Yeah. And I'm actually excited. I'm actually excited. You know, like I don't really know you except for just like from these video conferences. But you seem kind of cool to hang out. So, I mean, it'll be good. I'm you know, I feel the same way about you. Like people, people say stuff about you. And I'm just like, I don't know. I got to figure it out for myself. Uh, no. Exactly. <laughs> well, and, and, exactly. And honestly, even the, the pilgrimage company that we work with, Select International Tours, incredible people. Uh, from the moment I started interacting with them and they reached out to us, they when they got a, a wind of like what my vibe is as a person, what our vibe is as an organization, they were like, man, you guys should do some stuff with Father Leo because you guys are just so compatible. And I was just like, I, I guess so. Cool. <laughs> you know? Um, <laughs> yeah. So I, I'm really excited too about like the theme uh, for this pilgrimage. So so we had an awakened pilgrimage last year to the Holy Land and we called it Transformed by the Gospels. To me, the principle was like, you know, I want our experience of, of being pilgrims in the Holy Land to essentially be like a living out uh, walking in the footsteps of the gospel and, and, you know, kind of even become like that next level where when we pray the rosary and we pray the mysteries of the rosary, it takes us through the gospels through Mary's eyes. Uh, and it's meant to kind of be, uh, putting us there. It almost, uh, emulates in a sense, like what Ignatian contemplative prayer does. Right. And, and so for, for this pilgrimage to the Holy land, I wanted that to be like that next level of like, you're 
putting yourself into the gospels. And if the gospels are transformative on a paper, like just imagine being there. Right. And so, um, what I love about the theme for our Mexican pilgrimage here, um, uh, is, is that the title is food and faith of Mexico. And to me, it just makes all the sense in the world because gosh, darn, like we were just talking about you and I we're, we're, you know, we're pretty fun people. And, and to me, like, really, <laughs> I mean, you know, uh, I, I'm, I'm no black belt or break dancer or whatever, but you had to bring that up again. Didn't you? You to- <laughs> um, but, but to me, like, man, there is so much that Mexico has to offer in its, in its richness of faith and culture in, in such a powerful way. And, and I think that going into it with that mindset that like our faith isn't just like this super pious, like we, we levitate when we pray the rosary kind of thing. Um, our faith, don't? They, well, I, I do, but I just okay, assumed good. that you sure. don't. <laughs> Thank you. I want to make sure because that's the only people we're bringing on this pilgrimage. Okay. Our levitators. People that right? levitate. Got it. Got it. Uh, yeah. And if you buy, buy locate, you get extra points. Um, yeah. But, Discount. But our faith isn't just like this pious expression of prayer, even though that is beautiful and good in its place. But like our faith is also joy filled. Our faith is is um, this fully integrated experience of beauty and fun. And, and I think that all of that, uh, we don't we don't navigate that. We don't explore that enough as Catholics. And I think that our pilgrimage, Father Leo is going to do that very explicitly. Um, so I just wanted to kind of go through a couple of the, the key things here, you know, so the, the most obvious thing when you're doing a pilgrimage in Mexico, you got to visit the shrine of our lady of Guadalupe. Yeah. Well, first let's start off with this, that, um, I've been doing pilgrimages, gosh, even before I was ordained leading people through Rome, as a student there. And and I always kind of had a love for being able to show people around. It's just kind of maybe part of the hospitality bone that I have in my body. Um, And as a priest, I was doing it all by, you know, doing it by myself. And that's perfectly fine. But I, I realized that the lay community in our church need to start seeing themselves as pilgrims. Mm. And the reason is because, you know, as much as I love parishioners, they can sometimes get kind of annoying to me. (laughs) And I'll tell you why. Because they can develop a parochial mentality and they can become so very settled that they they forget that this is a pilgrim church. Mm. I mean, like, Grant, you might not be able to come on these international trips with us, you know, but at least do a pilgrimage and go to maybe a different Catholic church on occasion, maybe your cathedral, or I would say maybe go to a different mass time in your own church and see how it's, how about this? Sit in a different pew. Holy God, that's asking a lot. Can't do that. (laughs) So this whole pilgrimage experience, especially with lay people, kind of gives me a chance to, again, work with parishioners because I don't have a parish as a, as a missionary priest. I don't have a regular set of parishioners. But for those, you know, for that week or those 10, 12 days, we become a parish in a pilgrimage experience. And they mm-hmm. start to see their life a little bit differently. And so the best thing you can do as a Catholic is to go on a pilgrimage because it will make you appreciate that the Catholic Church is truly way more than those four walls that you put your envelope in every week. And more importantly, you're going to see how being Catholic is literally part of the cool people group. Mm. I mean, literally, it's the cool people group. Everywhere I go where the pilgrimages have tourists coming through, do you know why they come? Because of Catholic churches, because of a Catholic thing. And so in Mexico, yeah, you can go for the taco. And we're going to do that. Yes, we are. <laughs> yeah, we are definitely going to do that. But you go, people go to Mexico, not just for the beaches, but for the fact that a Catholic put a church around a beach area and turned it beautiful. Mm. That's why we go. Because wherever Catholics are, we make things awesome. Oh, that's a great fact. line. That's a great line. And it is a fact. Um Gosh, yeah, I, it's such an important perspective, and I experienced that. So, you know, this this Holy Land pilgrimage that I went on, like, uh, it, it was absolutely life changing and and, and paradigm shifting. I, I had been on one other pilgrimage that was a little bit not the same way because it was for a World Youth Day, um, uh, and it, it's 
crazy chaos. You have millions of high school students running around. It's not the same thing, but no, um, yeah, the amount of hormones in the air that uh, can't even be stifled by all of the incense that the Holy Father uses. It's impossible. Oh no. Yeah. It's a different form of pilgrimaging. Yeah. 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 And that was definitely a thing we had to deal with. Um, <laughs> but anyways, um, so yeah, my, my Holy Land, let, let, let's look at, for example, the Wailing Wall. It's not even a Catholic site. I went to it, but you know, if you think in, in broader terms, like, you know, Judaism is a part of our Catholic heritage, right? And older brothers and sisters in faith. Is what amen. Called. That's right. Yeah. And I went to, I've heard of the Wailing Wall for my whole life. I'd seen footage of JP2 there and all these people. And I was like, cool. I don't get it, you know? And I went there and I, the moment that I, I touched the Wailing Wall, I was flooded with the Holy Spirit. Like I was just, I became so unexpectedly emotional. It was unreal. And I came away with such a different appreciation for the Wailing Wall. And something- Are you gonna be a crier on this trip? No, no, no. Are are, are you gonna be- (laughs) I promise I won't. I specifically go out of my way to never feel. Uh, So (laughs) it's a coping mechanism I developed in childhood. No worries. Um, So, uh, but I just, for example, like to your point about how valuable, how important pilgrimage is, like- we, we build up these paradigms, these ways of seeing the world, the, the, these ways of seeing our faith that are so limited to our current set of experiences and the ways in which our faith is manifested. So if, if you're the average parishioner, like you were describing, like, yeah, you go to that pew that your family's been going to for generations and you, you know, check the boxes, you send your kids to Catholic school, but like we need circumstances that push us outside of those parameters, put us outside of our comfort zones and, and the, our experiences, we need new experiences. And yeah. so, you know, for me, something like Our Lady of Guadalupe, uh, as, do I remember correctly that she is the patroness of the Americas? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, patroness of the Americas, all of the Americas, right. South, USA, America, and, yeah. you know, our, our Canadian Americans. <laughs> <laughs> Go truckers. I'm oh just saying. Gosh. But but to me, it's like, hey, that's kind of a big deal. And I just have never connected with Our Lady of Guadalupe. And I'm like, man, I feel like I'm missing something. And if I had that experience with the Wailing Wall uh, in, in Jerusalem, um, man, what am I in for in terms of gaining a, a new appreciation for and under, adding color to the, the, the painting of my life, right? Um, yeah. I'm so excited to go there and, and to understand Our Lady of Guadalupe differently. Uh, I'm, I'm yeah. excited to go there and experience, you know, because there, there's a whole lot to Our Lady of Guadalupe. Like even just historically, uh, you have the Protestant Reformation where I don't, I don't remember the exact numbers, but some really specific number of Catholics left the church um, with the Protestant Reformation. And then in a very congruent, like very similar time frame. just as many or more people were converted to Christianity as a result of Our Lady of Guadalupe. And it's like incredible how we see the Holy Spirit work through some of these things. Do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, plenty. Uh, because that's what I do. Uh, but then more <laughs> importantly, uh, let's just go back to something even more simple and basic. Okay. We hear Mexico. And people, a lot of me go, go to like, oh, cool beaches. Or they might go to something negative like, you know, illegal immigration. Let's just mm. be very honest about mm-hmm. our prejudices, which we all have, which we need to talk to God about and more importantly confront. Do people see it as a pilgrimage destination? Not necessarily. Maybe mm. one place, maybe Guadalupe, but they forget that our entire country was founded by someone from Mexico who came up, discovered California, and boom, San mm. Junipero Serra. You know, he just discovered all of California. So there is a richness of a cultural, ethnic, unique approach to Catholicism that, you know, Americans in North America, America, will experience when they go there in the same way if they come to Rome, if they come to Europe, if they come to, you know, anywhere where there's a popular pilgrimage site. 
But with pilgrimages, you got to experience not just the pretty churches, and there are some pretty amazing things there. You have to experience the culture. So for me, my perspective, whenever I lead a pilgrimage, we don't just pray. We have to participate in the culture. And so there's two psalms that kind of capture my pilgrimage mentality, my ethos, my my Sitzenleben, my je ne sais quoi, my, my, these are big words. I realize that these are, these are the way I approach it. The Lord is my shepherd. There is nothing I shall want. First, we got to let the Lord lead us. And then the second song that kind of directs my pilgrimage experience is taste and see the goodness of the Lord. We've got to be able to let the Lord lead us so that we can not only hear about him, we can see Mm. And we can taste God's goodness. And so just get ready for some salsa <laughs> and some chili arbol <laughs> and some, you know, carne asada and some pescado. I mean, it's going to be really fun. But your point about going to Mexico and experiencing kind of like a unique approach to pilgrimaging, it's because Mexico and America we are brother and sister. We mm. really are. So get rid of any preconceptions regarding what it's like to be in Mexico. We just have to see them as really kind of like our own people, our, our, yeah. our kind of like our cousins in faith. And yes. thank God for them because there's so many people leaving the Catholic Church. Thank God we have cultural faith, especially our Hispanic communities who are keeping the faith alive. Yeah. Amen to that. Amen to that. And and there is going to be so much in this trip. There's going to be a link uh, in the description of this episode if you want to look at the itinerary in, in full. Um, and the other thing, like all of the incredible spiritual experiences that we're going to have there, um, all of the, the fun that we're going to have there, and we're going to get to visit some really incredible places. Um, this is a very like cost-effective entry point to pilgrimage like this trip in particular is very cost effective oh and we it just, is downright yeah, dirt cheap it's it is it is yeah and, and so you know it, it was tailored that way specifically to like remove a barrier to entry like you know none of us are going to be sending our well you don't have kids to send to college but i'm not going to be sending my kids to college as a result of this pilgrimage this is this is really like nearly at cost like this is this is we wanted to create this uh, opportunity to to become that that venue for that experience of like getting outside of your day-to-day -day norm and letting God use that like somewhat unsettledness that happens when we're outside of our comfort zones, outside of our normal environments, letting God uh, work on your heart in that. And then also experience the new things, the food, the culture. Um, and, and there's no one better to experience those kinds of things with than Father Leo Pedaling hug. Aren't you uh, something, Nick? God, I, that's what I hear. Well, but, you know, the fact <laughs> is, this is what I do. I mean, right. I'm a missionary priest, so I come to you and help you to remember that you are missionary disciples. You have to be on a mission. You've got to be sent. And I like that phrase. This is a good kind of entry point into a deeper understanding of being a pilgrim because mm -hmm. a lot of people, again, are so content of just being a parishioner. They sit in the same pew. They they read the same bulletin announcement during the homilies all the time. They basically mark their territory in church like they do in mm -hmm. the animal kingdom. And there's no changes whatsoever. And that's what a pilgrimage does. It opens mm -hmm. your eye to the greater picture, the greater reality. And it helps you to see how we truly are catholicos. You know, in the Latin mm -hmm. understanding, they call that universal. In the Greek understanding, it means fullness of spirit. And like mm -hmm. a place like Mexico, you're going to find yourself, I mean, good Lord, we can drive to Mexico. I mean, you don't even have to get on a plane or anything. I'm going to. But you can drive to, to Mexico and you're going to feel like you're in a completely different world. And a world that will not only um, change, but supersede your expectations and your preconceptions, wow. truly. It, it, it will blow your mind. Wow. Yeah. And, and something that just struck me, too, as you were saying that about like, you know, sitting in pews and, and really not being changed. So often we when we're li listening to a homily or even in prayer, um, 
you know, we might hear a great message in a homily that's very convicting that is like, man, if only my husband heard this or man, if only my wife heard this. And I, I, I heard this quote from some uh, obscure, like not commonly referred to saints. So I don't remember who it was, but it had something to do. It was something to the effect of uh, a, a true uh, mark of holiness uh, is when you hear a, a, an important message in a homily and you first or, or even just reading scripture and your first thought is applying it to yourself. Um, and so I think that even from that standpoint, pilgrimage can be an opportunity to like, because you're not in that pew that you're used to sitting in, because you're not in the environment you're used to, you can really dispose yourself to be vulnerable to God in a totally different way. It, it's almost easier in that context um, to receive for you, f- receive for what your heart needs and what your mind needs. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally makes sense because, again, I believe that if people even have an inkling to go on a pilgrimage, that's God inviting them to something deeper Mm -hmm. and it's personal. I also have to say that the timing is not simply because it was a time that you and I can find. It's actually a perfect time. Not even talking about just the weather in Mexico at the time, but I'm talking about our liturgical calendar. It's going to be right before Advent. Yeah. And so, it, it, first of all, you can get amazing Christmas gifts in advance. Okay, so just letting you know. It, you don't have to fight with the Black Friday <laughs> ridiculosity. But, but it is really in preparation for Christmas, St. Juan Diego, Our Lady of Guadalupe. We're going to be going there before all of those experiential feast days. And it's just going to give you a fuller, richer understanding of what God is trying to do in your life this Christmas, which is pretty significant knowing that in this year, we're finally coming out of the COVID craziness and we're going to have to see our faith a little differently. This is going to be a new liturgical year. So why not do something new and visit something as old as one of the oldest apparitions that we have, Mm -hmm. like legit apparitions. So also, I am a Mariologist, so there is, did you not know that? I did not know, yeah. Yeah, your face kind of I'm going to have to add revealed. that to the litany of, of uh, weirdness. Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> so uh, I, I, I have a degree in Mariology, so I spent three years studying very specifically the Blessed Mother in the life of salvation history and her relationship to Christ. We look through the miracles. We look at not just Marian piety, but patristics in scripture. So this is going to be a real Mariological experience in nothing, no better way to prepare for Jesus than to ask the woman who kind of brings them into this world. That so, is so exciting to me. That adds a whole nother dynamic to what this experience is going to be, because you're going to be getting homilies, people, from this Mariologist, Kung Fu fighting chef, <laughs> author uh, and speaker. It makes me wonder if I want to listen to them myself. No, I mean, <laughs> this is what I do. That's this amazing. This is what I do. That is so exciting. To me. I mean, I'm honestly, I'm just selfishly excited about this. Uh, <laughs> man, okay. Uh, viewers, listeners, if you want to learn more about this uh, pilgrimage opportunity, visit awakenpilgrimages.com. You'll see uh, a link there to get all the information that you need and to uh, register uh, or even just learn more. You'll also see their video recaps of last year's Awaken Pilgrimage to the Holy Land. So you can get kind of a sense of what that was like. Um, and man, there are so many reasons to be excited about this trip. I really hope that, um, you know, if you're feeling that tug, like father Leo was mentioning a little bit ago, that God is kind of making you curious about this. Like, should I go? If you're even asking that question, like you should come, what are you waiting for? (laughs) Yeah, really? Um, I knew I know a couple that uh, went on this last pilgrimage last uh, last year. You know, a lot a lot of people are like, "Yeah, pilgrimages are for old people that are retired and whatever." No way. So this very young couple, they have one kid. Um, they were like, when, when they saw a promotion for the Holy Land pilgrimage that we did, they were like, "Man, um, what if, what if we just did this?" And and you know. It, it's going to be tough figuring out the logistics with our son and, and all this stuff. But what if we just did it anyways? And they did it and it was incredible for them. And I just think you, you're you always going to find all of the reasons in the world to say no 
to an amazing opportunity to, to encounter God in a new and fresh way. But what if, what if you just said yes and, and trusted that God was going to help you figure it all out? So two things to respond to that, and I'm glad you brought it up. Yeah, granted, older people do come on pilgrimages because they have more time. But they all say, I wish I would have done this earlier because mm-hmm. it just it would have made so much more sense and helped them to grow old more gracefully. The, the reality is that while pilgrimage groups are older, take a look at everyone else who comes to those sites and you're going to see they're all younger. So what is your problem, young Catholics? What are you so weirded out by it? You know. The second thing is a pilgrimage should never be seen as a thing for people who are already into their faith. Mm. It's a thing for people who want to make sense of their faith. If you don't want to be a Catholic after coming to a pilgrimage like this, then don't be Catholic. Wow. But I guarantee you that if you come to something like this, your Catholicism will make more sense. It'll be much more enjoyable and it will help you in your future. I always tell people pilgrimages are an investment in your faith. That's what it is. It's an investment in the future of your faith. So just shut the faith up with the negativity <laughs> and just go. Amen. Great words there, Father. Um, Gosh, before I ask you uh, to maybe close our episode in prayer, Father, I just want to remind everyone, you can learn more about this opportunity at awakenpilgrimages.com. And this episode is brought to you by the Awaken app. Um, The Awaken app is an amazing resource. It has all of the the shows on it that are produced uh, by Awaken. It has what I, what I, you know, I'm, pretty unbiased opinion. Objectively, I think it is the most elegant and user-friendly prayer library on any app. Uh, It's trilingual. It's got English, Spanish, and Latin. You're not going to find it anywhere else like that. Um, And uh, community features. There's a Catholic music library in it. So visit theawakenapp.io. Thank you, theawakenapp.io, for sponsoring this episode. Uh, And anyways, Father Leo, bring us home with a prayer if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, so how about this? Through the intercession of St. Juan Diego and Our Lady Guadalupe, may God inspire all those who hear this and are intrigued by pilgrimage opportunities to say yes to the Lord, to experience the beauty and the fullness of the church, to experience, Lord, your grace working in their lives as they search in order to seek and find. Give us the grace to be holy as you call us to be, and we ask all of this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, Spirit. Amen. Amen. Father Leo, it is always uh, a pleasure and a blessing uh, to hang out with you and, and do this kind of stuff. Uh, looking forward to meeting you in the flesh. Uh, yeah, that's, that's not year. a big deal. It's just, it's, it's, it's only about 5'5. Five, five. <laughs> oh but it is 5'5 five, five of glory. And that yeah. is 5'5 five, five of glory that could kick your butt. So. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, not not at this age, but no, it, it really is going to be great to see again, you know, people who are on social media, people who are doing some things public for the church working together. So yeah. your audience, my audience, hopefully we're going to be able to come together, learn from each other and grow holy together for the Lord. Amen. Amen. Praise God. All right, everyone. Uh, I have been Nick. This has been Father Leo. And this has been the Awakened Catholic Show, not your grandmother's Catholic talk show. Until next time. Jesus loves you. Peace.